Hello again. I'm back and talking about my books again. And I'm halfway through describing um, the influence of Penguin books on me. Um, and I've talked a bit about, in the last episode, about um, being given books for O-level and A-level. As, as a great reader, as somebody who'd read all the Puffins, as somebody who'd read all the Doctor Whos and the Hardy Boys, and everything that was in our small town library for kids, moving into kind of studying English literature was this eye-opening thing where, you know, you can go and do this further. You can make it your life. You can become a, a writer, even if you come from Newton Aircliff. Um, in one direction, there was science fiction veering off in that way, but there was the classics as well, as I was falling for the things we were studying at O level and then A level. And I really did, you know, when it was, it was like catnip to be given uh, The Great Gatsby or Thomas Hardy. <laughs> it sounds so stodgy and old fashioned now, but it was to me. It's like that old cliche, and I forget who wrote the line, I'm sorry. Um, literature is news that stays news. These books were still fresh, especially uh, modernist classics like uh, To the Lighthouse, where you can't believe that this distorted version of reality, the, uh, uh, they all smell wonderful. Um, seeing the world through the eyes of, of kind of damaged characters and what that does to the prose. It's another old saying, isn't it? Uh, that literature is uh, violence done to language. It's uh, GDH on language. I think that's one of the Russian formalists <laughs> said that. That's popped into my head. Here's a copy from 1988 of Roald Dahl's stories, Kiss Kiss. Now, I'd loved Dahl's kids' books, and his stories were a complete revelation to me. This one's a particularly good collection. The first one I dipped into, well, I didn't dip into it. I mainlined, I freebased this. <laughs> Begins with the landlady, which uh, is the one where she's practicing taxidermy, isn't it, on all of her, um, all of her young gentlemen who come to stay with her. But every story in this is fantastic. Royal Jelly, where they turn the baby into a bee. There's lots of spoilers I'm coming out with, I realise. Yep. Whatever they say about Dahl, he's still a great read. And, uh, yeah, he's there to be found forever. Whatever they do to make him more mainstream, tidy him up, fancy him up. That terrible Wonka film, which is so sentimental. When he's not, he's spiky and sour and bitter, as well as sweet. Jane Austen, Persuasion, took me a long time to be persuaded about Austen, I think. The one I really loved was Sense and Sensibility. And I remember that being a big deal when that kind of suddenly made sense to me. In about 1990, um, spring 1990, I remember I started keeping a proper reading diary, a list of everything. and. I think in one day or one weekend I read Sense and Sensibility and My Enemy, My Ally, a Star Trek novel by A.C. Crispin. And that was kind of um, me in a nutshell at that point. Still is, really. A bit of Star Trek, a bit of Jane Austen. Persuasion I want to go back to because they were talking about it in something else I read as somebody's favourite book, obsessing about it. And I forget what it was, but it made me think, oh, yes, I should go back and reread that. Pez by Barry Hines. Now, <clears throat> now finding novels uh, that were literary and by working class authors was really, really important to me. Alongside reading Virginia Woolf and, and E.M. Forster, to have people like D.H. Lawrence or people in a line of direct descendants from him like Barry Hines was really important. To hear dialect that felt looser, colloquial, more jagged, more realistic, was really important. Laurie Lee, as I walked out one midsummer morning, um, this is a travel log and about setting off for a 
fascist Spain, I think, just on foot. It's a really lovely book. I read it many years after reading uh, uh, Cider for Rosie. Again, a present from uh, my mum. Uh, there's a Christmas book by him as well, or a long Christmas essay that I still need to uh, get a copy of. I've read it somewhere, but I, I don't own it. Got to collect the set. Penguins were the original Pokemon, I think. Jean Reese is a great read. And these copies that are kind of like beaver, in, you know, the, the kind of 1970s nostalgia for the 1920s. And her first books, these slim, bitter tales of women being shafted and chucked by terrible men, um, were from the 1920s and 30s. And then, of course, she went missing for, uh, for years and years, missing, presumed drunk. And they found her again and made her write a classic. I think Frances Wyndham, who was an editor and writer, was the one who uh, made her write um, uh, Wide Sargasso Sea uh, in the 60s, 70s, and brought her back to life and brought her back to fame. And we met him once. He was a great character. Zulika Dobson, Max Beerbohm, which is a very funny kind of... Uh, slightly magical story. Um, he also wrote the fantastic Enoch Soames, which is a kind of ghostly time travel story, as far as I remember. There's a great, huge thing. This is a present from my friend Mark in 1993. Elizabeth Bowen, um, whose stories I loved, this is all of them together, when they started doing these pale green, very classy editions. She looks so severe on the front. <clears throat> Cookery books. Elizabeth David. Italian food. This was the time in which penguin were the experts on everything. And whatever you, whatever you want to find out about, there would be a penguin or a pelican uh, or a puffin book about it. And it was um, undisputed. <laughs> they would be um, the best you could get. And the Elizabeth David books are very reliable. And in fact, recently I did see the whole lot in a charity shop and I didn't buy the whole lot. And I should have. Um, more H.E. Bates short stories. I can hear creeping about. There's <sighs> Jeremy trying to get into the videos by leaving me tea. I know what you're doing. Um, I don't remember anything about that. That was something I read in the summer, lying in the garden here, 2012. The Man Who Loved Squirrels. <laughs> it's such a slim book. No, nope, I don't remember any of those stories. I'll, I shall have to go back to that. Now, I've only found two of these. Somewhere I've got a complete collection of Penguin, John Wyndham books, uh, who did the chrysalids, a post-apocalyptic novel about mutants. <laughs> that, puts it, that makes it so, trivialises it so much. Chocky, which I suppose now they'd say was all about AI. Um, and somewhere I've got all the rest. The Day of the Triffids, um, Midwich Cuckoos, Trouble with Lichen. There was about six absolutely brilliant ones. And these were the covers from the 70s. Um, kind of photorealist paintings, and they were really collectible to people of my generation who had all the Doctor Who books and, and the rest of it. You'd have to read John Wyndham. We read a couple of them at school, actually, which kind of imparted this excitement. Everyone was excited about John Wyndham. There's been things come to light, hasn't there, since uh, earlier books and letters and things, because he's quite a mysterious person, really. We didn't know much about him. But we didn't have to know much about the writers, I suppose. It was only later that that became all the thing, and you found out about, you know, the lives of Ian Forster and Virginia Woolf. And sometimes that could improve the books or it could spoil them. 
Uh, and some schools of criticism would say that you wouldn't have, you didn't have to know anything at all about the writers. I like knowing a bit of that kind of gossip about their lives. This was the copy that everybody had in the seventies of Watership Down. It's actually in Puffin. Um, it was colossal. It's such a fantastic book. My mum had this in the seventies in this copy, and um, I didn't read this until much, much later until I was kind of properly adult. I knew the film. I loved the film. Uh, I love books about animals and that great tradition of uh, animal books that goes back to the wind in the willows and things like that. And of course, it's a way of writing um, about adult concerns, but disguising it all. It's a way of writing about politics like George Orwell in Animal Farm and disguising it. It's, it's, of course, it's allegory, but also it's a way of smuggling, smuggling stuff in. And for kids' books, it's a way of writing about all kinds of adult stuff in disguise to get the stuff past the gatekeepers. And it's a way for younger readers to imagine what the future might be like, what adult life might be like when they do it through the lens of imagining themselves to be animals. Herbs and Spices by Rosemary Hemphill. The Penguin Book of Herbs and Spices. What a find. With chapters on everything. I haven't read this, unusually, amongst all of these. This is from 1959. This is one I haven't read. Fennel Seed Potato Cake. Oh, it's a chapter on lavender, but that's the most soothing chapter. There's no scent quite like lavender, each spray containing the warm, sweet smell of summer. Shakespeare, in The Winter's Tale, calls it hot lavender. Here's flowers for you, hot lavender, mint, savoury, margarine, the marigold that goes to bed with the sun and with him rises weeping. Even on the bleakest winter's day, when a dried lavender flower or lavender sachet is held and inhaled for a moment, a picture immediately forms of long drowsy days, humming bees and a glowing tapestry of flowers in the garden. You need to hear that today. When it's cold and piddling down outside. Whoops, they've fallen on me. F. Scott Fitzgerald's short stories, and I've talked about Gatsby and the importance of discovering his books and his small shelf full of novels and reading all of those, but then discovering his short stories was massive. And I remember one hot summer day in 91, escaping from our house and getting on the bus to Darlington and going to dresses that I mentioned before, with not very much money. I think I had enough to buy one book, and this was £2.50. Uh, and coming back with this collection of stories, and I think I'd finished it just about by the time I did return home at the end of that day. Yeah, he, uh, he really made me want to write short stories. Speaking of which, Susan Hill's edited collection the Penguin Book of Modern Women's Short Stories, which sounds very proper. She's out in the park reading, isn't she? Like I did that day, going to South Park in Darlington with F. Scott Fitzgerald. This is a really good collection from 91, from that very year. It has stories by uh, Elizabeth Taylor, not the film star, the, the, the actual writer. The Devastating Boys which is a story about fostering children and these kids laying waste to this woman's house. Sheena Mackay's story in this is good. Georgina Hammock's story is wonderful. Uh, Sarah Maitland's. A.S. Byatt's classic, The July Ghost, which is a haunting uh, story about somebody's dead child coming back to them, I think. It's a really good collection. I don't know if it's still in print. And finishing with Faye Weldon, Weekend. I haven't got any Faye Weldon in these piles, and I should do. And I want to go back and and reread her, I think, and read the ones I haven't read. Faye Weldon was really, really good. And I think, uh, I think in the future people will see that more 
I think. She'll come back into fashion. She'll be the voice of a particular era. At the moment, people just remember Life and Loves of a She-Devil, because it was on TV. Paul Gallico, Jenny, one of his cat's books. Uh, Forster's aspects of the novel. Now, he got a bit of a drubbing before, didn't he, from uh, Catherine Mansfield. He was better than she thought. But it is quite funny. What she was responding to clearly was his, what she would see as his uh, sexlessness. Of course, it was all hidden and clandestine. She wouldn't have, she wouldn't have known the real Forster, I suppose, which is kind of in his gay short stories, the life to come, when he lifts the lid off that teapot just a bit. Here's an important writer for me, Nell Dunn, and this is a kind of slightly more obscure novel from later in her career, tear his head off his shoulders. Um, Poor Cow and Up the Junction are the other ones that you have to start with. But in terms of somebody hearing the everyday vernacular and absorbing it and rendering it in a kind of non-patronising way, she's an important figure for that. Paul Gallico again, Flowers for Mrs Harris, or Mrs Harris Goes to Paris, as it's been filmed as twice. One of my favourites. Another story about a London char cleaner. L.P. Hartley's The Go-Between. Go um, I can't even think when I, when I read this. I remember sitting in the uh, doctor's surgery in Newton Aircliff, uh, waiting with my mum, so it must have been the 80s, for one of her appointments. And I believe that doctor's surgery has had uh, two serial killers <laughs> involved in it over the years, seriously. Um, yeah, it's quite shocking when we found that out. Anyway, I sat with her uh, in the 80s. I remember reading Frankenstein waiting there. And this, which famously begins with, the past is another country, they do things differently there. When I came upon the diary, it was lying at the bottom of a rather battered and cardboard collar box, in which, as a small boy, I kept my eaten collars. See, most of these books were all about poshos looking back into the past. I had to overcome a great deal of prejudice in order to enjoy the books we were given to read. Here's Decline and Fall, Evelyn Waugh. Again, 1991, I read this. I think this is his first one, I think. Uh, there's more John Wyndham, Trouble with Lycan. Thank you, Jeremy. And there's today's book post arrived, just <laughs> sliding into my cell. The Letters of Scott Fitzgerald is a huge, compendious thing. This is real treasure. I read this August 2002 in Manchester. I love books of letters. My favourite of all time is uh, Too Brief a Treat by Truman Capote, which I read on a ship in the Mediterranean in 2010. And you learn so much more about people from their letters, especially if there's lots of them and they cover a whole lifetime and the waspish, waspish shrill, nasty, sharp clawed Truman Capote of legend is, uh, is never there in his letters. He's, he's kind and sweet. And Scott Fitzgerald is amazing in letters, full of crippling self-doubt. <clears throat> From what I remember, there's my copy of Howard's End, trying to warm the pot. She was so wrong, I think. I loved Howard's End, still do. Evelyn Waugh again, <laughs> Brideshead. Uh, more Lawrence, The Rainbow is the, I got it wrong before. Women in Love is the sequel to this, of course. Now this, I, Look at the notes, these tiny scribbled notes everywhere. I was obsessed with the substance of this book, the way he, he uh, 
they seem to mash language up and it's not stream of consciousness but it's like kind of thick and pastel paint he gives a sense of whatever's going on through molding and melding and and, and smooshing his his sentences the language is pliable in his hands i was fascinated by that right lastly science fiction now my uh uh on one hand i had science fiction on the other hand i was reading modern classics and here they came together thanks to brian aldis with penguin science fiction and more penguin science fiction and there was i think it was either called further science fiction or even more science fiction he was a very witty man this has got everybody you'd expect and and, and more besides and it, it goes through chronologically i think and picks out some very eccentric very peculiar stories frederick pohl robert sheckley asimov arthur c Clarke, all those people and um i think yeah, it wasn't that, it was like kind of 2010s I read this before I came upon these collections. I wish I'd read this particular set earlier. Um, Aldous was there, this huge, very genial figure at the first literary party I ever went to on Charing Cross Road in 1995. I'd had my first story published and... Uh, the whole book was reviewed in the guardian that day and they've been very nice about my story at the expense of everybody else <laughs> in a way it kind of it was a james wood review uh james wood who writes for the new yorker now and is very grand he did this big two-page piece in the guardian saying that most people you know put in bottom of the drawer stuff leftover stuff for new writing for which was bit unfair really but then praised uh my story which was great <laughs> it was so exciting to go feeling fully you know very confident although terribly nervous going into this place to have a glass of white wine with all of you know as Bayer and alan hollinghurst had edited the book and i walked into this this bookshop after hours and it's filled with people and i'm here in the middle of it uh, or the first person I saw was Brian Aldous, who was very, very friendly and very welcoming. And I'll, I'll always remember that. I think it was just that once I met him. But that's, that's, you know, that's what these people are, aren't they? You don't need to, uh, to see much of people to know, you know, to, to, to get a sense of, you know, here's somebody magical and they just kind of float past you and you know, you've read their books. It's important. It's like seeing the lions at Longleat. <laughs> That's what it was like, the literary lions. When I was a kid, we used to go to Longleat Safari Park and drive around and look out the windows at all these amazing animals. And you couldn't believe they were there. That's how I still feel about meeting some writers. Others are like the baboons of Longleat who jump on your car and rip off the windscreen wipers. But not all of them. Some of them are more sedate and regal <laughs> and interesting. I don't know how I got round to that comparing all the writers I know to animals in a safari park, but I might take that image and run with it. But for now, I must stop. It's gone over time. Please like and subscribe and all those things and look at my Patreon and I will see you again soon. All these books are going to fall over. See you again soon in the next episode. Bye-bye.